This is going to be a little video about MegaWorld and specifically how to use the management system. And it'll also illustrate maybe how things are related in MegaWorld. For example, how to create quests and how NPCs and items and buildings and other things like that relate to each other. By watching this video, you should be able to get a pretty good idea of how to use the management system and how to build content using the management system for MegaWorld. And with that, you should be able to create some hopefully pretty interesting content for students to play that can support educational goals. So this is great if you're a teacher or professor, and uh, we hope that this is gonna be really useful for you and that MegaWorld will be a useful tool for teaching, uh, something to add to your arsenal. So let's get started. You're gonna need an account. We don't support self-registration right now, so you're gonna to have to ask somebody for access. Once you've got that sorted, here's what the dashboard looks like. So this basically shows you all of the different areas of MegaWorld that you can manage. And the main ones you're gonna use frequently are all up at the top on the header. Let's get started by showing off the basics of how to use the interface here. Management has a bunch of features that are common to almost every page. So obviously at the top you've got a little menu here. You can toggle a dark theme on and off as per your preference. And you can log out if you want. There are commonly used links at the top. And almost every page is based on this data table view that you see here. Where you get a table that shows one row for each record in the database. There's a little selector at the top where you can show how many items are displayed on the page and you can control that. So if you want to display pretty much everything in the database, you can select the biggest number, which is currently 5,000. And if you want a really fast loading view, if you're on a slow connection or something, you can always pick a smaller number. There's a search filter at the top. If you start typing something in, it pretty much just searches instantly, which is really handy. And if you want to sort, you can click any of these headers at the top. You can click it again to sort by reverse order. So we sort, for example, by ID here. And you'll notice that we also have the ability to sort by more than one column at a time. And that's why you see a faint arrow on the column that I previously clicked. If we go to players, we can demonstrate that. So we can click on, we can sort by, let's say, professions. This is actually sorting by the number of professions. We can sort by money and we can do a sort by energy and have a secondary sort by money. So we can see all these people have the same amount of energy, but we're doing a secondary sort by energy. So that's pretty cool. A lot of tables like this one also have an extra field where you can specify another filter. So we can show people only born in this one particular city. Let's try this one. And we can also see that there are 59 players who were born in Eastgate. Management Interface has a modal dialog for editing items. So if we want to look at this player's details, we can click that pencil icon. It brings up the little editor and you can scroll through. We can see here that he's got a profession and we can delete that by clicking the X. We can also delete any quests that the player has, which can be useful if they're having trouble completing a quest or something gets maybe messed up in the game. And you can delete players by using the X, or you can delete any record on any table really by doing that. The exception might be that some tables don't show an X there. For example, if we go into maps, we're not going to see the X by many of the maps because they are used by other things and the game will let you delete them. But another feature that's pretty neat is that you can check items here and then you can perform bulk action so we can give each of these players $20, 20 mega dollars and uh, if we want we can also select every row on a page using the checkbox at the top. You can even select everyone in the entire range that's selected, the range that's being filtered, or if you do this, you can even select everything in the entire database, and you can perform a bulk action. You could delete every player in the database if you wanted, so you have to be very careful with that, but it's powerful if you want to do some mass cleanup stuff, and you don't want to have to go through and 
edit tons of things at the same time. So that'll save you a lot of time if you need to do a lot of work on cleaning things up. If you want to create a completely independent set of quests that is not tied into any existing content, you probably want to start out by creating a new map type. So let's create a new map type here and I'm going to call this demo video. And we'll hit save and we should notice that shows up at the bottom here. You can also click at the ID column and have it sort the most recently created things first. So you can see it right there. So we've got our little uh, map type. And once the map type's created, we can create a new map to add to it. I'm gonna sort by reverse map type so we can see the most recent things first. And let's make a map. So we'll call this Bradford and add it to our demo video map type. There we go, we'll give it a little description. Normally you'd wanna use this to explain what kind of content you're gonna put on this map, so when you're administering it, you can kind of tell what it's for. This is not seen by the players at all. And let's see, so we notice that we now have our new map. However, there are no tiles in it, so it doesn't look very interesting compared to some of the existing maps. So what we need to do to get started here is to click on this little map icon, and that brings us to the map tile editor. So the map tile editor will actually look quite a bit like the game interface itself. And at the bottom, there are three panels. The buildings and NPCs panel will be covered later, but they basically just show a list of those items on the map and there aren't any there right now. So let's start out by expanding the X and Y axes. So we see here it says no map tiles, but we have to fix that by clicking these buttons here a few times. So what are we at now? We've got a seven by six map. Most of the maps in Mega World tend to be about 10 by 10, but you can make them almost any size you want just to fit your needs. You could, for example, have a small room that's only four by four or something like that, or you could have an extremely large map that is maybe 30 by 30. Getting significantly larger than that might cause some performance concerns, so just be careful with that. You'll notice here that I'm moving the cursor around just with the arrow keys on my keyboard and that works just fine. You can also use these controls if you're using a touch screen. So let's start out by putting a little path on here and uh, you just click these little tiles to place things on the map. So we can add some features, a little lake, and how about we make this uh, coastal community. So we'll add some ocean tiles here. So let's go on and talk about adding buildings next. So to add buildings, you're gonna to have to go back to the dashboard or the click the little home icon on the nav bar. And here we go into buildings. So let's go back to our map actually. I'm gonna open that in another tab. You can middle click to open it in a new tab here. And we'll see our map so we're gonna add let's start out by adding a web page to this tile here that has the display the billboard on it so that's going to be at 4-1 in Bradford so we need to remember that and if we click the new icon or the new button here we can add our add a little building. So buildings essentially are a way to travel between other, between maps or between tiles. And you can also have a web page on them. One of the features buildings have is that they can show a web page. So if we do this example, 
and we specify a link here for HTTPS. And we'll add a link to Athabasca University. Oh, we forgot to put the all important coordinates in. So that's gonna be four one for that particular spot where we had the billboard. And if we go back, and we'll have to probably refresh this to see, see it listed under buildings here. There's our building. If you click this link here, it'll actually go directly to that building, and then you can continue to edit it. And you'll notice now that we have it in here, we can also add a list of professions. And that's a way for you to kind of block a building so that it only shows for people after they have a certain profession. So you could use it as a portal to another level or another map that they're only able that students are only able to complete once they've gotten to a certain point in the game. So we can see if we go back to the map and sort it. We have correctly placed the map on that particular tile. And you can also create a building that goes to a totally different map if you want. That's probably that really the most common use for these. You can actually do both at the same time as well. You can have a building that acts as a link and as a portal to another, another map. So if we wanted, we could have this map go to this abandoned city. And I'll just have it go to... Uh, about two, two for now. And we can see if we go back to our map. Like right there that it'll indicate what map this is taking us to. And the player will see an option to travel when they arrive at this particular tile because there's a building there. Birthplaces are where players may choose to create a character and that allows them to start off at a point that is relevant to them for a certain set of quests or whatever basically. So we have our Bradford map, so let's make a birthplace on there. And we'll click the nice new button and we will say born in Bradford. And the map type, we'll, we'll have to pick the in uh, the demo video type and our new city. And kind of going to be handy most of the time also. Just, just a pro tip to keep your map open in another tab when you're heavily editing a brand new scenario. So let's go back here. That is totally not the one I meant to pick. Bradford. There we go. So let's have a little birthplace be this quaint looking cottage here, which is at one five. So if we go back to our birthplaces and pick one five, we will now have a birthplace in Bradford. Let's sort by ID and we'll see it's right there. And we can delete this one because no one's been born there yet. Let's just jump into Mega World real quick and kind of see what this looks like. So you're going to want to make sure that you play test your quests and your maps as you create them to make sure everything's working okay for the players. So I'm going to jump into my existing account here and open the menu, create a brand new player. Let's call it JD Video since I'm making this just for the video. And we will see, this is what it looks like when we create a birthplace. So we've got this big menu and they're kind of grouped by the map type, which is one reason it's important to have a map type. It just makes it a lot easier for our players to kind of find a specific birthplace. And there's our Bradford location. Okay, let's go on and purple pants looks cool to me. 
And here we are. So this is what the game looks like. And we're born at our little cottage. And we can move around. And we see this little sign here. If we click travel, we wind up at this kind of random seeming spot in this other city. And you'll notice you have no way to get back to where we started, which isn't really great. So normally you wouldn't want to, uh, to do that. But just for the purposes of demonstration, that's where we've ended up. So let's go back. Now that we've got a birthplace, the next thing we need to talk about is professions. We go back to our dashboard and we can see professions. So in Mega World, what are professions? They're essentially a, a way of limiting access for players and um, they are the me main way that players level up in the game. So there are a number of professions already in the game. Let's make this a little bit longer list so we can see them all. Um, you can totally create your own and then you can use professions as a means of restricting access to portals so that players must in the case of these existing ones they have to become a programmer which doesn't require anything and then they later can become a java programmer if they have 200 experience points doing quests for programmers and and so on and so forth so you could for example make a portal or even other quests that are only accessible to these professions and that's basically what the professions do in mega world so you can use those as sort of the the leveling system for mega world and that's what players have to aspire to to gain access to other professions ex gain experience in those professions and then they'll get access to further parts of the game all right next something really important is npcs for npcs these are how you get your quests and how you get your professions they also sell items so there's a lot of things that npcs are responsible for in the game and let's go back to our little map editor here and how about we'll give an npc to this little cottage where the player can be born click the new button all right I'll call this um, NPC Bob and give him an icon. There's a number of icons to choose from. Um, as you can see, there's some different themes here. Um, what you can try doing is uh, just type in like some keywords. So let's make this a, a guy and uh, how about I'll make it this elf man here and put him on our demo video map type. And I can't remember, one five was the coordinate of the, of the little cottage. So you can specify more than one tile for an NPC. So basically you're specifying a little square. So you could have the NPC, for example, have a top left coordinate of one five and a bottom right coordinate of two four and the bigger that area the less likely the player is to find that NPC so it's basically the inverse of the number of tiles times two so if you had the NPC spread across these four tiles then there would be a 50% chance of the player finding them. And if they were on eight tiles, it would be like a 25% chance and so on. Uh, if it's really critical for a player to find an NPC and you'd make their location encompass the entire map, it's going to be really tricky for the player to find them. The odds are just so small. So be careful about doing something like that, unless you're making some kind of hard to find Easter egg. Um, the level is not really used for anything other than just to indicate kind of how advanced the player is. So maybe this guy will just give him some kind of middling number like five and we'll save him. And if we go back to uh, our mega world, so we notice our player is kind of stranded here and he can't get back right now. We can fix that simply by uh, going back to players. And let's find our new player by sorting by ID again put him back to his birthplace Boop, that little button there nice and you can see he 
immediately returns, which is pretty cool. So in the game, if you hit enter, we can see we can talk to Bob, but he's not really very useful right now. So we want to give him something to uh, to something interesting to actually uh, help the player. So let's try find our NPC guy again, and we will. How about we give him a profession, and we'll make the uh, we'll make him train the player in that profession. So now he's he's going to train as a programmer. If we go back here, so we can see Bob will now allow our player to become a programmer. Cool. So now we have the means for the player to be born somewhere and get trained as a programmer, and uh, and so on. So. So that's one of the things that NPCs can do. They can train a player in a profession or more than one profession. They also have the ability to have portals that work just like building portals, except that you can restrict the um, player to having uh, a certain level. You can also require that it costs a certain amount of money if you want. So we could make a portal that goes back to um, our example city again here, and we'll just name it, uh, we'll call it far, far away, and we'll go back to our 2-2. Two, two. Let's make it level one. Okay, so now if we interact with the player, yeah, we made the level a little too high because the player is still level zero. But we can uh, let's try just deleting that. We'll add our city and maybe we'll try this time level zero. Okay. Now when he talks to the player, there's a level zero portal. We can pay our NPC money and wind up back on our portal again. Or wind up back on that other map. All right, the next thing a player can do is they can offer items to the player. So we could have, um, let's say, a loaf of bread. We'll add it. So that's some of the stuff you can do with non player characters. But one of the other key things you can also do is give quests. So let's talk about that for a little bit. So I'm just going to open up a, a new quest. We'll kind of make a little demo and just show what all the different aspects of them are. So I'm going to give it a real creative name here and we'll give it a level of zero. So the level is important. That sort of determines what level the player has to be in their profession and the highest level in any profession really uh, before they can accept that quest. You can specify that a quest is repeatable, so that means the player could do it over and over again. But you you would usually want to give it some kind of a cooldown time, so the player can't just keep doing the quest over and over and over and over. So we can say that they have to wait an hour and a half before doing the quest again. And we will make the giver NPC Bob. And then um, you can use this checkbox if you want the NPC to give the player whatever quest items that NPC has. All right, so most of the other things in a quest are dependent on other keys. So you have to actually save that quest and then we can continue editing the other parts of it. All right, what else have we got here? We can require that the player has a certain profession. So we now know that the player can easily become a programmer when they start this series of quests so we'll add that and say you have to be a programmer before you can accept this quest and you can also make the player require other quests so that you could kind of make a sequence of quests that the player has to complete by requiring the previous quest be completed before they get to take this one all right so in this case uh, we notice that we have like really cool icons um, you can there are actually quite a few icons for items uh, but just for this demonstration most of the items don't have a meaningful icon yet um, well let's see let's say NPC will give 
the player this amulet when they when they start out and we'll add um, our NPC our Bob okay so now Bob will have available this item when the player is doing that quest until you click this the player won't the NPC won't give the player the item when they start the quest automatically they may have to buy the item or, or get it from them separately but if you have a big list of items that are needed for a quest the player can get them automatically from the NPC if you click NPC gives quest items all right next you can specify quest tools I'll talk about that a little bit later that's kind of a more advanced feature that you probably won't use a lot and target NPC you could create another NPC that the player has to go to and that's sort of like their destination um, if you don't specify this the target will actually be the same as the uh, the giver NPC which is up here prologue is what the player is first sees when they look at the quest from the NPC so the NPC will kind of introduce the quest with this little phrase and the content is probably the most important part of the, the stuff you're going to type in here this is what is shown by the NPC when they kind of get um, when the player accepts the quest it's shown in the players details when they view a quest in their uh, list of quests and they will also see this when they're trying to complete the quest um, so we can do something completely trivial like this and you'll notice you see a little preview here and that's because you can actually put HTML tags and you can put uh, math ML and stuff in here so if you wanted to make this a little fancier looking you could do um, something like this x equals one plus one and you kind of use these uh, escaped square brackets and um, I seem to be doing something very wrong oh yeah it only shows math ML if you have a calculation type of quest I forgot about that part so if we look at our different types there are quite a few of them uh, just to demonstrate the math ML stuff I will pop in this type and then we notice boom we get uh, our fancy math stuff we can even do stuff like um, square root of I think you have to use curly bra braces and I totally did that wrong uh, you probably need a forward slash in front of it there we go so now you can do some fancy math markup with things like that that are pretty hard to do just with vanilla HTML or especially with just plain text. Um, of course, we're actually asking what the square root of 2 is in this question. All right, so that is one of the features of Mega World, the ability to sort of do uh, a lot of mathematical stuff. I'll uh, expand a little bit on that later. So target NPC prologue is what the player sees when they first um, meet the target NPC. And then there's a certain response if they, if they complete the quest successfully and a different one if they fail. So you can obviously be a little more creative than I'm being for the purposes of quickly making up this video. Um, if they get the answer wrong, they can be given a cool down time here so that they can't just kind of keep trying over and over again. Sometimes maybe you want that, but you might want to make the player wait a little bit. So we could say they're going to take a minute before they're going to have to, before they're going to get the ability to try again. And you can specify your rewards here. So um, maybe we'll just give them a small amount of XP because this is a really simple question. And uh, this is sort of like generally keeping track of how advanced the player is. It doesn't mean as much as the profession XP. This is more important for leveling. 
So just keep that in mind. You can give the player both, but uh, but the profession XP is probably more valuable. And you can give them some money. We'll give a player a dollar if they get square root of one plus one, correct. And then uh, what else? They can also get a reward item. So they could get this amulet, which you might want to actually give the player one of the quest items uh, because when they complete a quest, the quest item will actually disappear. So it might be important to give them one of those items as a reward. Otherwise, they won't get to keep it. This base reward percentage is used in text quests, which is kind of like a measure of how close the player's answer is to the original specified answer. There's a fancy system that kind of analyzes the similarity of words and will uh, you can kind of require that the player gets like 50% or, or 100% if, it, if you need it to be exactly the same. So if the player answers something that's just a little bit different than what you specified, they'll still get um, credit for it. But for this type of quest, let's just do a calculation quest as an example. And I'll go through the different types of quests in a minute. All right, so in this case, um, we've kind of already got the question in the in the content here, but if we wanted, we could also put that in um, in here. And then we could say, well, the answer is going to be, um, good question, what is the square root of, uh, of two? 1.414, typically you're going to only require um, two decimal places of precision. So that should be fine. All right, and now we have the player, uh, the player will see this as a question and have to provide that as an answer. Um, you can actually get pretty fancy with math quests in this. So you could even actually just type in square root of two here and uh, you can also do things like variables. In fact, actually, let's do that. Let's add a variable here. It'll be a little more fun. We can say uh, we're going to go between 1 and 3. And so we now have this variable. So what do we do with those? Well, we can use that variable here. So let's just call that uh, a plus 1. This variable will be evaluated with whatever value the player gets. So every time the player takes a quest, any of those variables will be automatically assigned a random value within that interval. And if we go back to our um, content here, actually, I probably should fix the grammar here. All right, let's go back and I'll now add the variable here. So what you can do is just kind of copy out um, we basically use a pair of brackets like this around the variable and sorry I'm doing this totally wrong. Be right here. This placeholder with two sets of curly brackets around it will be replaced in the game with the actual variable that the player got. So we kind of have the beginnings of a quest here. We don't have the, the text fleshed out very well yet, but if we go back to the game and let's see what happens when we talk to Bob. All right, so we do have our quest showing up, so that's great. And if we click it, it'll say, okay, he's got a job for us. Let's see what that is. And he gave us an amulet, kind of seemingly for no reason. Maybe that's something we'll need to give to somebody else. Um, and now that we're, we've accepted that quest, we'll see it in the list here of our quests. And we can see, uh, he's asking, can you tell me what this is? But we don't really know what, and we'll see that there's some rewards. So the player can be kind of motivated to complete the quests to get those rewards. So if we click, uh, go back to Bob, and let's see if we can complete that quest. All right, cool. So we see we have our first answer we're looking for, and uh, okay, so we have to answer what's the square root of one plus one. And actually, just to demonstrate that this is in fact a variable, 
I'm going to drop our quest. And we can go back to Bob and accept the quest again. Yeah, there we go. Took a couple of tries, but we can see that the uh, variable has changed. And let's see if now this is the square root of three. And uh, let's see if that ends up being right. So we should be able to answer 1.73. And yeah, we got it right. Cool. You'll notice here that we've also achieved programmer level one. And how does how does it determine when we advance in level? In a nutshell, for all of the quests that you have for a profession at a certain level, if the player gets 90% of the XP available for that profession, given the quest that you have, then they'll level up. So that's how you can kind of determine um, when the player hits the next level. It's, you want to create a number of different quests and when the player gets the vast majority of those points, then they all level up to the next level, and then you can have subsequent quests that the player can take that are a higher level and stuff. So our little square root of one plus one or whatever is a pretty low level quest. Getting back to our quests, I wanted to mention a few details about the different types of quests there are, and there are quite a few. Uh, many of them are quite similar, but uh, let's let's talk about them. So if we open up this result type dropdown, we'll see that we've got uh, got a whole bunch of things. So the simplest kind of quest is the check-in type of quest. So in this case, you would have uh, essentially the player just has to go and see another NPC, the target NPC, and then the quest will be completed. And you can also require that they bring quest items with them. So, and where are we here? In this case, um, we don't have any items yet, but we can say, hey, you've got to find um, this shovel. And the player can't complete the quest until they find this shovel and bring it to the target NPC. So that's, that's one type of quest. And another one is each of the quest items acts as a true and false uh, question sort of and you usually what you do is you'd go edit your item so if we uh, middle click that we'll go to a new tab and see our item and we can have uh, like a description here which serves as a question and then the each item will serve as a true or false option and you can also have uh, choose one so each item essentially becomes a multiple choice option and Choose multiple is very similar, but you can have more than one, or you can even have zero. Item order is kind of fun. In this case, the player will have to sort the items into a certain order. So a couple of things here. We're going to need the items, and I've got some added in here that I've created, like some different wands. And what we're going to do here is ask uh, a question about old Mac OS versions, basically, and get the player to sort them in the right order. Now you'll notice that they're already in the right order if you know the history of Mac OS X, but they will actually be presented in a completely random order for this type of quest every time the player views the items. So that won't be a problem. You don't have to worry about them being already presented in the correct order. You just have to drag and drop these items kind of in the order that you need them in. You just grab a little drag handle here and, and do that. We're going to actually have the player get the items from the NPC. So we have to add them all into here. So let's look for our wands. I'll do our cheetah and find Bob and add the item. And we will try the Puma wand and the Jaguar wand. And that's all looking great. So let's save our quest and go back into Mega World. And let's see. Okay, so the reason we're not seeing that quest show up is because we've actually already completed it. So if we want to fix that, we want to find our intrepid player here. 
and what do we need to do so we've seen that he's completed demo quest let's just delete that for a second go back to mega world and talk to bob and ah, there's our demo quest again so let's accept that quest can you tell me what order these go in cheetah puma jaguar well that's interesting <laughs> that they happen to just show up in the right order there but uh, the odds of that i guess are pretty high because there's only three but you can see here they're not in the correct order so uh if we go talk to bob again now we have to drag these items into the right order so what's the right order well uh we'll try this one nope that's not right so we got it wrong we didn't even try but let's see cheetah puma jaguar that looks better submit hey you got it right and i got some money nice so that's how you do item ordering quests just one of many kinds of quests there are let's go over the remaining types of quests uh, let's see we got text answers so that's like if you wanted to actually specify um, some answer here I don't know, in this particular example you could have uh, you have to type in the version numbers for each of these or something for mac os 10.0, uh, 10.1, 10.2, uh, I think. Jaguar, yeah, that looks about right. And uh, so you can you can get a little more involved. Um, also, you can do close. In this case, you would specify a quest like. Um, still have my old math question here but you could have uh, a question for in this case let's use our mac os example so we'll do cheetah and then we'll add in b which would be our puma and then c would be jaguar Now that we've got all of these questions and answers here, essentially the way we do a close quest is we create some content and then these guys uh, become fill in the blanks. And we actually have a little handy shortcut here to see what all your different variables are or different answers are, I guess. And you click that and it'll copy the little placeholder right on uh, the onto the clipboard. Or you can just type it out with the double curly braces. So Mac OS 10 started with um, a, then 10.1 was B, and 10.2 was C, oh, C. Yeah. and we will see the preview. Oh, we missed one here. I want to make sure we get that. Okay. We can see our preview. Looks good. Now, when we view that in the actual quest for reels, I have to probably delete our player's quest again. So let's go do that. We will delete his completed quest, and now that, that lets us do it again. Of course, we could just make the quest repeatable as well. But it's good for you to know how to do that because sometimes you need to delete a quest from a player and that might not be very obvious. So let's take our quest again. Okay, cool. So he still gets his items even though they're not really needed for the quest anymore. And now if we accept the quest, we'll see our little blanks here. So we have to put in cheetah, puma, jaguar. Hey, we got it right. So that's what a close quest is. So just a type of fill in the blank and that explains how to use all those little variable placeholders in the quest content here so that you can have your fill in the blanks. So fairly straightforward to do that. You got the little placeholders here that you can use. Uh, just click to copy on the clipboard if you want to do it that way. All right, what else we got here? There are a few more. True, false. Okay, so these types here that don't start with item, they all use these kind of question and answers. They don't have anything to do with items in this case. 
So you can just type in a question and then uh, uh, in this case it'll be, uh, this is a true or false question, so we'll word it like this. Um, Oslo is, oops, is the capital of Norway. And then in this case it would be true because that is in fact true. And we add that and we see now we have this question as true. Okay, I'll delete these guys because we're not really using those anymore. Okay, and then, um, I don't know, something like Finland is the capital of Helsinki. And that is not quite true. All right, I'm going to switch this quest to a repeatable quest with no cooldown time. Save that, all right, let's do another quest here. Demo quest, so. Try to complete our quest here and we have our nice true and false answers. So Oslo is the capital of Norway. Finland is not a capital because it's a country, not a city. And boom. So that's another type. So this is similar to the item true false, except instead of items, you're just typing in an answer. Sometimes it's a little bit fun to sort of have these items and you can have cool icons that go with them. For the, for the players to interact with. And you have to take them to another player and do all that stuff. Uh, but sometimes you just want to give the players some, some questions. So you can do it that way too. Um, wow. Okay, here, let's go back into our quest, our demo quest. And we'll talk about the last couple of types here. Where are we here? This quest configuration gets really long and really complicated. There's a lot of things that you can pick. All right, so choose one. Uh, basically, you're providing multiple choice uh, options here with the value and choose multiple, very similar. You can choose more than one. Text long answers. In this case, you're going to ask a question and then uh, you'll get the ability to specify um, a long answer. It can be on more than one line, but for adding it initially, you have to type in one line and then you can always expand because they give you these text areas that you can add later. And then when you save it, it'll be good to go. What else we got? Calculation, kind of talked about that a little bit. You can type in formulas here, they'll be evaluated. You can get pretty complicated like this example shows. And uh, you can do your questions with math ML and everything. So we can do our whole um, uh, square root of uh, four. Maybe it looks something like that. And then uh, that would be, that even gives us a little preview here. And that would obviously be two. So you could have calculations, but if you wanted to do something a little fancier and you, you can use variables and everything is, well here, you can type in a um, sort of a programming friendly formula or equation that will be evaluated by the program. And uh, in this case, we're going to do, uh, I don't know, let's just do like one plus two or something. The answer will be three. Save that. Go back to Mega World and try out our quest. So demo quest. So in this case, he's gonna have some kind of math questions to do. So that would be two and that will be three. And how you got it right. So that works pretty well. And I'll just note something that when you get a little fancier with these math questions, um, you can create variables. We've actually got one here already. Let's create another one. So this will be, let's say like negative five and, and uh, I don't know, nine. So we'll have a fair range on this one. And in this case, we can actually do like A plus B. And here we can also type in A plus B. Actually here, we want the player to see what the number is, otherwise they'd have no idea how to solve it. So we can use our little placeholder text there and that will show for the player 
Um, if we want to be a little fancier, we can always do like MathML as well here. Let's try that. So our escaped square brackets, save that. Let's see what happens when we try to perform that quest. Except we're still getting all our ones, which now bear no relationship to the quest. So those should probably be removed. All right, cool. So now we have some different variables. So two plus negative four. All right, let's see if we can solve that. So that should be minus two and this will be two. And looks like it was correct, nice. You can get pretty fancy with your math questions, do some algebra kind of stuff. And uh, I'll just also mention that you can give each of these answers like whatever letter you want. It doesn't have to just be one letter, but uh, it's limited to a certain small number of characters. Um, you know, you could call a question alpha if you wanted. Um, you could do something like this. Square root of one. And there we go. Having a hard time here. And that question would be um, alpha. All right, a couple more types just to go over. Finally, scroll all the way to the end, and we will see there is coordinates. And coordinates, basically, this is the player finding a spot on a map, and you're going to have um, X and Y coordinates. You specify a map. It doesn't have to be the current one. And these X and Y coordinates can be equations, just like for other calculation quests. So you can make the player go and find something. When the player gets to that location and checks in, then the quest will be done. So it's a little different than most of the quests in that they don't require meeting a target NPC. This conversation type right now works just like a long answer quest, except you actually will use the microphone. One final type of quest we have is item calculation. So this one uses the value of all the quest items. Let's pick one of our wands again, add it. So we can give, give this uh, an answer that would be uh, some kind of a calculation so we can put a formula in here and the you could put the question inside of the item descriptions so if we open that in a new tab and edit it like you could put in you know your math ml or something like that if you wanted and then that would show up as the uh, as part of the items description and they, we can also use quest variables in there. So we can take these variables and actually make them part of the answer. And uh, if you go back into the item editor here, so for example, we can put in uh, like an A in our double parentheses here. And then go into here and put our like A plus one. And yeah, that's, I think that's gonna work out. A, so A becomes one through three. Save that. Try actually performing that one. So we'll see A plus one, and then we have to, oh boy, that's not gonna be great. Uh, in this case, you actually would have to put the variables in the results, I forgot about that part. So if we go back to our demo quest, now we'll have to say something along the lines of, uh, here are your variables or your keys or whatever you want to call them. There we go. A is equal to A. A is A. That, yeah, that'll actually show up with the number when you view it in the game. So let's try that again. Demo quest. We'll see that we now have our variable displayed there. So that looks good. And now the player can solve this by replacing A with two and the answer should be three. Cool. We're good to go. All right, one more quest pro tip here. And I wanted to mention that sometimes when you get it really deep into a game, you're gonna have 
a lot of different quests and a lot of complicated prerequisites for a player. And you need to test your quests, you need to test your content to make sure it's going to work or you're going to end up with some very frustrated players. So I've got this handy button here called Ready Player Zero for Test. So what happens if you click that, it seems like nothing, but what's really happening is there's a special player zero. Let's go and have a look here. The first one in the list. And that player will have his location changed and he will have the correct professions added and the correct prerequisite quests added all automatically uh, when you click that button. So if we go back into the game for a second and, uh, and switch the player, we can select this test player. And actually, if you want to use that test player, um, this is important. You're going to need to go into the configuration for the test player and set the user ID to your user ID. So in, in my case, I'm setting it to mine, but if you have a different account, you can sort of uh, hijack that player for your own purpose. Just you know, make sure no one else is using it when you're doing that. Um, and only use this feature really for more advanced quests where it's kind of tricky to test otherwise. So demo quest, click the pencil, ready player zero. And there we go. Our player zero now gets moved to that location. And he, if we look at the little player panel, he's now a programmer. And he has, if there were any quest prerequisites, he would have those. So that makes it really easy to kind of jump into the game without having to play it a whole bunch and test your quest just to make sure you've got it all configured correctly and it's going to give the correct answers and that sort of stuff. So with that, that just about wraps up the overview of Mega World Management. But uh, I hope you found this whole video pretty educational and interesting and that it's really uh, helped you understand how to create content for Mega World because it's not all that simple if you don't have uh, maybe a little bit of uh, an overview of how to do it. So let me know in the comments or otherwise, uh, get a hold of me if you have any more questions or you'd like to know more about Mega World. Thanks for watching. I'm glad you made it this far and I hope you have a great rest of your day.